All right, everybody, welcome. <laughs> now that we've got that fixed, uh, we're in a different room than we usually are. There's a lot of activity down in Las Vegas right now because of CES. But welcome back to Angel NV Bootcamp. Uh, we're getting down to the end here. This is our last sort of educational session. Next week, we'll be back with a pitch, another pitch practice in deconstruction. But tonight we have due diligence from Leith Martin, and he is one of our best instructors, and he gives this talk um, to the angels as well. So you guys are not the only ones that are learning about how due diligence gets done. So I won't take up any more time. Welcome, Leith. Maggie, thank you very much. Let me share my screen. As Maggie mentioned, um, this is a presentation that's actually quite frankly, very similar to the presentation I do for the angel investors, the people that are learning to be angel investors, um, because I think it's important to understand from the founder standpoint why angel investors should do due diligence, um, because I think it'll make both sides a little more, how should I put this, um, patient with the process. It's incredibly important to the process. So once again, Maggie mentioned, my name is Leith Martin. I'm... Um, uh, I'm a, uh, the executive director for the Troche Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation at UNLV. Um, I've also started three or four companies. Uh, I've raised, I don't know what the total is, somewhere between five and $10 million for startups that I've actually founded myself. Um, and I'm actually a general partner in 1864, the seed fund that, uh, that is spun up here in Vegas as well. So let me ask you a quick question, and then I'll keep an eye on the chat here as well. And, and the couple that we have in the room, John and Chris. You know, why Why do you think startups fail? So why do startups fail? What are all the reasons that startups might fail? And there's lots. Just throw up communications, right? They have bad communications teams or bad communications in general. Why else do startups fail? Perhaps a disconnection. Well, that goes along with that disconnection yeah. expectation between the actual uh, founding team and the investment team. So okay. Could be. Could be. What else? What are other reasons they might fail? Lack of money, David says, right? So that could be one. They don't have enough money. Um, poor marketing and research is what Barton said online, right? What else? Any other reasons that you can think of? Overreaching, like I started with my vision instead right. of, you know. Right. Maybe, maybe yeah. being too strategic, too strategic and less tactical, right? Or operational, maybe. Uh, David also mentioned there's no market for the product. So that might be a reason as well. Um, I, I think the reality is, is there's lots of different reasons that companies fail. Anna said that there might not be enough passion on the team, too broad in terms of their product offering. That could be that could be it as well. There's a there's a great uh, TED talk given by a guy named Bill Gross, who is the founder of a company called the Idea Lab. Um, and Bill does a it does a really good job of talking about the different reasons that startups fail. And ultimately, what Bill did is he measured five specific things and then looked at all the companies he's ever been involved in starting as well as all the other companies um, that he spun out of the idea lab and he ranked all those companies based on five criteria and the five criteria was the business model the team market timing funding and the idea those are the five things he ranked because he felt like that the reason that a startup most traditionally fall would fail would fall into one of those five categories so, so Bill started ranking those, and he figured that, that uh, the number one reason that companies fail is actually uh, market timing, meaning they went to market with a product that the, the market wasn't ready for or was the wrong time for the market uh, for that particular product. Um, the customers weren't ready for it, whatever it may be, but market timing seemed to be incredibly important. And it turned out that funding was last on his metric because his thing was is if it was a really good team and a really good opportunity, then they could always find access to funding. But the, but the idea here is, is there are lots of different reasons that startups might fail. And so it's incredibly important. So it's incredibly important that angel investors do due diligence on companies they're going to invest in. Because the reality is, is because there are so many reasons they're going to fail, they need to at least be comfortable with all of those reasons and make sure that they're comfortable when they actually give money to a startup. So the actual definition of due diligence is the investigation or analysis the investor performs to ensure that an investment opportunity meets the criteria for funding. Uh, the primary objective is to mitigate investment risk by understanding the company and its business. Right? So that told me why an angel investor or an early investor does, it, does um, due diligence. Now, 
So the reason I wanted to show this is because I wanted to show how important it is that due diligence is done by the investor. All right. So if the management team is capable and motivated and they get a nine out of 10 on that score, right? Uh, if the market demand is as expected, meaning that they've gone and analyzed the market correctly to a nine out of 10, if the production is scaled up as planned, meaning they're executed perfectly on the production side and scored a nine out of 10, if you added all of those things up on that list, there's actually a 48% of probability the company will be successful. And that's a deal that for the most part looks incredibly good, right? They scored a nine out of 10 on all of those. And then if one of those is actually 50%, then the probability of success for the company falls to 27%. Right? So why is due diligence incredibly important? Because the reality is the risks are incredibly high. Um, and so the reason the investor asks for those things is because they're trying to make themselves as comfortable as possible that this deal is fundable, and then ultimately it's going to be successful. There's lots of market research that shows the angel syndication, the angel capital association tracks lots of metrics in regards to um, um, success and failures of startups that are invested in by angel investors across the United States. And the metrics or the numbers show, say that five out of 10 startups fail. Of the remaining five, two, maybe three become what's called the walking dead, which means that they operate, they continue to be in business, they pay their own bills, but they're never gonna exit and provide a return to the investor. Of the two or three that are remaining, a couple might do a four or five times return and hopefully one will get them 20 plus. So the reason that they have a high expectation that there has to be a high rate of return to them is because the likelihood of failure is so high that maybe one, two or three are actually gonna succeed enough to return capital to the original investors, especially at the early stage or the angel round. So be cognizant of that when you're working with an angel investor because the reason they're asking for a decent valuation is because they have to have a decent valuation because their at-risk capital is so, uh, is so high. And so, so, so understand the need for due diligence, but also understand that this isn't a test. Uh, uh, they're not calling you out and they're not trying to dig into things that they may or you may feel they may or may not need to know. The reality is they're trying to find out and make themselves comfortable with the investment because the likelihood of failure is so high. Now, when should due diligence take place, all right? Now, this is incredibly important from a founder's perspective, um, is that um, oftentimes what happens is I see founders, they focus on every angel investor that they can get their hands on or every investor, they send them a deck, they pitch, they do whatever. But the reality is, is that angel investors or any investor is no different um, than many of us. We feel like we know more about certain industries. So guess what? We invest more in the industries we know more about. So if you go pitch your AI product to someone who's used to investing in medical devices, there's a pretty good chance they're not gonna invest. Right? So find investors that have industry-specific knowledge of what you're working on or industry-specific experience you know, based on your own startup. Right. Some investors only invest in pre-revenue. Some only invest in post-revenue. If you're pre-revenue and you don't have revenue, don't pitch to an investor who only does post-revenue. Because guess what? You're wasting your time. They're wasting their time. And you're going to probably get a no. Right? Make sure that it's compelling, meaning that they understand that, that it's something they might want to do. Make sure that you provide a proposition that's going to provide them an exit in somewhere around five years. The truth is it's probably eight or nine. But if you, pay, if you think it's 15, there's no chance they can put their money in, right? Because the return is so low on a 15 year horizon that it doesn't make a great deal of sense. Um, so they're looking for an exit. If you don't provide them an opportunity for an exit, investors are uncomfortable in the deal. Do you, do you have a strong management team that you're presenting to the investor? Um, and so make sure that you're preventing to, uh, presenting to investors that you meet the criteria for which they are most likely to invest. Now, you might ask, how do I know what they invest in? Um, well, there's lots of ways. I mean, you can look on AngelList, you can on Crunchbase, you can find out what investors have invested in these kind of deals, whatever industry you're in, and make sure that you're pitching to investors that are most likely to invest. Because the truth is, they're gonna be more likely to invest in deals they're more comfortable with. They have industry knowledge, 
they, they, you meet their criteria on pre or post revenue, whatever those things may be. So try to understand that when you do a pitch, because the reality is, is that if you meet their criteria, the likelihood of investment is dramatically higher. Um, invalid reasons, meaning that oftentimes I tell investors, sometimes investors do foolish things. They do things like they'll say, I want to make 10 investments this year, $100,000 a piece, so I want to invest a million dollars this year. Well, guess what? It's month 11. And I've made eight. Guess what? The last two deals you do are probably going to be bad because you put a time, you put an artificial time on the a perspective on the deal, or I've got to invest by a certain time. You're the last five people at the bar and it's the end of the night. Guess what? You're going to get the phone numbers, whoever's left. Right. So make sure um, that you're working with a group of investors that are in the right frame of mind. Uh, and then also another invalid reason investors often use is I've got some extra money. Maybe I should have just invested in this market. All right, now, this is how due diligence is done. Um, and there are lots of different ways in which different types of investors will do due diligence and also different ways. And oh, by the way, if anybody has any questions, even online, throw it in the chat. I'll try to keep an eye on it, but Maggie will interrupt me in case there's something that I miss. Um, um, but, but oftentimes due diligence is done by some core group of trusted people, all right? So it may be people that you know or people that an angel investor knows that they'll say, you know what, I know John, he's done his due diligence. He thinks it's a good deal because John thinks it's a good deal. I think it's a good deal, right? So sometimes there's a trusted group of investors that will do their due diligence. And then because of that trust and they're willing to invest, other people will follow on based on the competency of that core group of trusted individuals. Sometimes they'll share a due diligence package. So sometimes um, Sierra Angels will do due diligence, create a due diligence package, and they'll share that with Tech Coast Angels. And then Tech Coast Angels will review it. And if they've got additional questions, they'll ask, but they'll take that due diligence package and that'll get them a lot of the way there. So they don't have to start from scratch, right? So that's pretty common as well. That happens a lot of times as well. Sometimes an angel group or some group of investors will have a committee. And the committee's job is to do the due diligence. And as a result of that, they'll meet with you. They'll fill out their packet. There's got a checklist of things that they might send you first that you fill out. They might come back with you with questions, but there might be some sort of committee that does this for the group themselves. Sometimes they're how they're hire an outside law firm to do that. Um, I've seen that happen as well. Uh, also understand that this is a two way due diligence process. This isn't just them testing you. What's your credit score? Are you good or not? This is also you're trying to figure out whether or not they're an investor you want to let in your deal. All right. um, it's when you're raising money and you're desperate, the reality is, is you think all money is green. Uh, and that may be true, but not all money is created equal when it comes to investors. If an investor is hard to work with, it's a tedious process in the uh, dating cycle, then the marriage is going to be a disaster. Right? So once the money's in the deal, it's going to go bad. So make sure that when you're going through the due diligence process, you're comfortable with the investors that are doing the due diligence. Because if it's not going well, it's not going to be a good relationship more than likely. So it's a two-way process. Um, there are consultants or professional um, firms that actually can be paid to do due diligence by individuals or by groups. Um, sometimes an angel investor will do it themselves. Uh, and they're like, well, here's the way I do due diligence. They'll send you the packet or they'll sit down with you over four or five meetings and ask a lot of questions. That may be the way they do diligence, due diligence for themselves. Um, this is, this is I often get asked by investors. Uh, I had a founder ask me to sign an NDA. Um, uh, I, um, I know almost no investors who will sign an NDA. Uh, and, and you can't blame them. Right. I mean, how can you blame an investor signing an NDA? Because let's say that they meet with John and they're like, John, I really like your company, but, you know, I'm not comfortable with it for a number of reasons. But guess what? Next week, another deal that comes in the same industry comes up and he really likes that deal. He can't invest in the deal because he signed an NDA. Right. So and the other reality is, is that lots of times founders come and see me and they'll say, hey, I want to talk to you about a deal. And they'll say, but I need you to sign the NDA first. And, and oftentimes what I say is the only thing I know for sure about your opportunity is you're going to fail. They haven't told me their opportunity yet. And they're like, how can you say that? I don't know. You don't even know what I'm working on. And I'll say, well, if I have to sign an NDA for you to tell me about the deal, that means you can't get additional investors. 
You can't hire, you can't get additional partners. You can't get employees. You can't get anything because you need an NDA. And not only that, it kind of, the truth is, is that uh, ideas are cheap. They're everywhere. They have no value. Execution is what matters. And so I'm not telling you to give away the secret formula to the polymer that you created, but guess what? The investor doesn't want to know that anyway, because they don't know what all the polymer components are. They just want to know what it does. Right? And so you can talk a great deal about your deal without giving away trade secrets. And so if you ask an investor to sign in today, most often they're going to be like, yeah, I'm out. And even if they don't even know what it's about. Investors shoulder the cost of the due diligence. You should never pay due diligence for your work. Um, so if an investor asks you to pay for due diligence, then you should not pay. Right? Now, it should show, uh, it typically shows a lack of experience um, from an investor if they ask you to pay for the due diligence. It, it just shouldn't happen. So don't pay for it. All right. So here's something else that, that they're doing due diligence on. They're due, 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 doing due diligence on the team, right? So what are the credentials of the team? Have they worked in a startup space before? Do they have successful exits or not? What kind of experience do they have in the industry? Those are the things that they're looking for, right? Why? Because let's face it, the team is the group that is most likely the thing they're investing in. I'll never forget, I, I, I was asked a number of years ago, um, by a group of investors to come in and help save a company that they had invested in. Um, and um, it's a long story as to what happened. But I remember asking one of the investors, I said, hey, why did you invest in this deal? And he said, I invested in the founder. I didn't even like the deal. Uh, I didn't even like the industry, but I thought the founder could pull it off. Whatever he ended up doing, I thought they could pull it off. And so oftentimes, investors are investing in the team. How good is the team? And do we believe in the likelihood that they can pull it off? So if you have valid credentials, display those. Um, they're oftentimes will do a background check. They'll measure through meetings. They'll try to figure out what your mindset is, right? Uh, a, a startup founder has this unique contrast or this unique balance between um, insanely stupid optimism and practicality. Um, and, and it's a weird balance, but that's what's necessary because the risks are so high. Uh, as founders, we're stupid for doing it in many respects because it's incredibly risky. But the reality is, is we have enough confidence that we can do it. So we're willing to try anyway. But you can have too much confidence and you can have not enough confidence. And so they're trying to figure out what your mindset is as well. They're testing your leadership ability, right? So... How likely do you think that you can lead the group of people necessary to get that group of people to do something incredible to build a startup? Right? Um, are you honest and you have integrity? They might call people that you know. They might ask them, what do you think about them? You know, to try to get some understanding. If you've got skeletons in the closet, you know, they want to know. Um, it doesn't mean necessarily that they won't invest in the deal, but but most of the time, investors understand that there's a significant risk to losing their money. And so they don't actually typically get mad in the fact that a startup fails, but oftentimes is they might get mad by the way that you failed. You know, if the startup's going bad and you disappear, that's not good. Right? Future investors will be uncomfortable with that if this is your next startup. Uh, I'll never forget. I was, I met a guy in my neighborhood one time and, and um, I, we were, I was walking through the neighborhood and, and, and started chatting with this guy and, and turns out he was an early investor. And so I was an early stage investor. So I was chatting with him and, and he was telling me about a deal that had gone bad. And I just asked the question, I said, well, would you do another deal with that founder? And he said, yeah, all day, every day. And I said, why the company failed? Because I was curious what his answer would be. He said, yeah, but he failed the right way. We always knew what was going on. He gave us every chance to help. He gave us every chance to help support him in any way but it didn't work out. Um, and so I don't hold anything against him. He said, I think he's incredibly talented. So honest and integrity really matters. The other thing to realize as a founder is bad news doesn't get better with age. It doesn't, <laughs> right? The worse the news is, the longer you wait, it doesn't make it better. The reality is, is the sooner that things are going bad and you communicate with your investors, the more likely they are to be able to help you figure out something as opposed to basically, you know, it's too late, we're shutting the doors, everything's over. Um, so make sure that, that you manage 
you will, I always tell people that the great thing about friends and family as investors is that they typically know you incredibly well. Um, they have a relationship with you. Uh, they're more likely to care about things other than just financial return. They're likely to care about your personal success and things like that. But the downside is they know you extremely well. And if the, you haven't been very a very good friend or a family member, then they're less likely to invest. And so make sure that your reputation is solid when you when you try to do those things. You yep. see that? You, yep, go ahead, Maggie. There's a question there from Sean. Um, he wants to know if having an international team is a red flag for investors. You know, it's a good question, Maggie. I, I would say today, no. I, I would say that investors would be a little uncomfortable if you've got a um, entirely outsourced uh, Romanian development team, because they might be a little uncomfortable with the, you know, how committed they are. They've got 25 projects they're working on. They're actually not part of your company, those kind of things. Um, but having in today's world, having team members scattered all across the country, all over the world is so much more common than it was even five years ago. The pandemic broke a lot of these geographic restrictions that lots of investors had in the past. I can remember um, before the pandemic, sending some really good deals to friends that were doing in, uh, deals in you know the Bay Area or say Salt Lake or Southern California. And there were Vegas-based companies that they used to say, well, look, tell them to move to, to the Bay Area and I'll look at the deal, right? Um, now they don't care. Um, and so the pandemic broke a lot of those, those types of things. And then finally, do you as a team or do you as a leader have good judgment? Um, because the truth is when you're running a startup, you don't have all the information and you will never have all the information to make a hundred percent decision. Um, I heard this comment the other day and I thought it was incredibly, incredibly good. Uh, they said, um, if you're not slightly embarrassed by your initial prototype in the marketplace, then you probably went to market too late. Um, and I always thought that was pretty interesting because knowing that judgment between this is good enough to get in the marketplace and start getting feedback or this, because if it's never going to be perfect. And if you wait until it is perfect, more than likely you're too late to market. All right. So what are the other things that they're trying to figure out? Right? So what is your business model? Um, do they believe that you have a valid value proposition? Um, do they think that you understand distribution? Now, these kind of things are, are, are oftentimes, in my opinion, overlooked oftentimes by founders. Because I've often asked founders, well, what's, what's your distribution channel? I mean, how are you going to access the market? Are you going through resellers? Are you third-party logistics? Are you actually doing everything on your own website? How does this work, right? Um, and I oftentimes think that, uh, that founders um, are a little, and, and that, as I mentioned before, they need to be a little confident in order to be able to be a founder. But sometimes I meet with, they're like, yeah, well, this is my customer's Google or blah, blah, blah. I'm like, you know, probably zero chance that it's either any of those big companies. More than likely, you're going to have to find some initial market before. I've only known one guy whose first customer was Google. Uh, he's a founder I know is based in the Bay Area, I mean, based in Southern California. Uh, and his company was a company called Telesign. And so I think it was Telesign. And his company, when you first used to sign up for, say, a free Gmail account, you would sign up for a Gmail account, you'd get a confirmation email, you'd log in and you would set it up. Well, it turns out they were using all these free Gmail accounts for spam. And so Google had a problem. And so his company developed the phone authentication text. So in order to set up your free email account, you had to get a, put in a phone number. It texted you an authorization code. You put that authorization code in. And guess what? If you're a spammer, you can't set up a robot and set up a million phone, cell phone numbers to receive all of these things. So their spam uh, load went down dramatically. And then they sold the service to Chase and Facebook and everyone else. And then they exited, right? He's the only one I've ever known his first customer was Google. So my point is, is that if you walk in and say my first customer is Google, more than likely the investors in the room are kind of all a little uncomfortable because they think that, that more than likely that's not the case. So understanding your distribution channel is incredibly important. How are you different than your competitors? And do you understand those differences? That's incredibly important. What is your growth strategy? Are you going to acquire other companies? How are you going to acquire customers? Are you going to grow geographically? 
Are you going to grow, grow vertically inside a specific channel? Are you going to grow horizontally? What's your, what is your distribution? I mean, what does your growth strategy look like? Do you have recurring revenue? You know, the reason everyone loves SaaS, see Alex is because it has recurring revenue, right? Um, if you don't have recurring revenue, that means for every new customer that you get, you have to develop a new customer. And guess what? Then you sell something to that customer and the customer goes away forever unless it breaks or they need a new one. Then they come back and get another one. That's hard. It's expensive. And those things have to be built into your business model. So make sure that you understand the differences between different types of revenue models. What's your capital requirement? Um, and having a really good understanding of that capital requirement is incredibly important. Most investors, not all, but just so you understand that most investors will listen to your pitch. They'll say, okay, if I cut um, the amount of money uh, that if they say they're going to reach X amount of revenue with X amount of, of investment dollars, if I cut that number in half and give them twice as long to do it, does it still look like a good deal? Because the reality is, is you've probably underestimated the amount of money it's going to take and you've underestimated how long. And as a result of that, then they're going to they're going to they're going to consider that. So make sure you have a good understanding of capital requirement. What's the deal structure? You know, convertible notes. Am I dealing with a safe? What's the what's the valuation? What's the deal structure look like? Um, and those things are obviously obviously incredibly important as well. And then finally, what is your exit strategy? Now. Here's the interesting thing about exit strategies, and I'm not sure that if you went and asked a bunch of investors, they would tell you this. But this is the reality. Everyone in the room that's an investor knows that you do not know your exit strategy. Because a pretty good chance you can't predict in seven years what the world looks like, which is more than likely for a really early stage investor, how long they're going to have to wait to get their money out. But the reality is, is they're really uncomfortable if you don't talk about it. Because then they're thinking, well, do they know I want my money back? Right? Um, so make sure that you at least provide an exit strategy, a potential strategic acquisition or someone who might buy you for whatever reason, because investors want to know that your goals are aligned. Your goal is to exit and make money. My goal is to exit and make money. Let's make sure we're all on the same page. Now, most investors probably wouldn't say, yeah, I don't believe you, but they don't believe you. Um, and if you don't talk about it, they're uncomfortable. All right. So make sure that you have an exit strategy because if you don't. Yep, go ahead, May. Um, there's a question in here. Um, a A M N A M was piggybacking on Sean's question about having a team that the development team is overseas. They're part of his company, though. That's Sean's story. Uh, this person is asking uh, their team is in Las Vegas. The mm -hmm. market they want to go after first, though, is in Asia. And then they want to expand throughout Asia before coming to the States. And he or she wants to understand how would, I'm guessing, American mm -hmm. investors feel about that strategy? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, I, listen, I'll be honest with you. Um, if I was an investor um, and I was dealing with uh, a startup whose entire market was out of the country on a different cotton, I would be uncomfortable. Um, I'm not saying all investors would be that way, but I'm saying I would be, um, because I, I would question now it depends on the product. I mean, I guess if it's a total SaaS based product and the market is there or whatever, maybe, right. But if I'm, or if you've got a distribution partner there and you're, and you're out and you basically are building something there, but I, I would be uh, at least uncomfortable if I had a team and none of the team members were in a market where the largest customers uh, or the market that you're targeting. I'm not saying it's possible. I'm not saying under no circumstances would it ever happen. I'm just saying as an investor, I would think most people would be in um, yeah, They They clarified that it was Pakistan to start and then eventually the Far East. Um, but as an investor, Leaf, I'm with you. I wouldn't. Yeah. There's so many opportunities that are in the States that you can look at that this is just a level of complexity that makes it yeah. something that's not interesting to me. Plus, you know, you, you know, investors are often more comfortable invest investing in um, a geographic location where they're most familiar, right? If you ask me to invest, Maggie, you mentioned Pakistan, 
I mean, I happen to know a fair amount about, about Pakistan only because I spent a lot of time in India. Um, my first company had an office in India. I've got several people that I work with that live in Pakistan. But if I didn't, you know, what do you know about Pakistan? Not good stuff, probably. Right. So there's a pretty good chance that no one would be comfortable investing in a company that their customers were in Pakistan. So, you know, I, I think under those circumstances, I think every situation may be a little different, but I would say in general, that might be tough. Um, I noticed there's a couple more here. Pakistan is start with eventually far east. Okay. I, I think the truth is, is that you'll probably be better off finding your initial group of investors in that market. Um, it would probably be much easier. All right. Good question. Any questions? Go ahead, John. I have another question here regarding um, recurring revenue here. And this actually dovetails a little bit off of a presentation there, closing out next topic. Um, look, I get it with regards to, you know, the last couple of days, probably I did so, which is SaaS company, mm -hmm. but I totally get it regarding recurring revenue. Now, this current one that I've, that I've built out, Teach Enterprises, mm -hmm. is going to start looking a lot like professional services. Sure. They're going off their U.S. government small business innovations research, so it's project based and then you know, do a little bit of that, set the groundwork down, and ultimately migrates to a product that we can then sell to SaaS offering. It's so, so it will take a little bit of time. I right. guess my question is, do you think investors, our investors going to come up with that? Or because I'm not I'm not coming at it initially as a SaaS play until this is where it's going to start as a pro serve play, and we'll eventually right. keep all SaaS. You know, it's a good question. Here's what I would say is that... Um, Wait, Leith, can you repeat the question? Though? Yeah, great. Thanks, Maggie. Um, so John asked the question, uh, under what circumstances or would investors have an appetite to invest in a business that might start out as a professional services business, would ultimately turn into a SaaS company, but in the beginning might be professional services? Right. I, I think the reality is, is the way um, I would approach the business strategically, if that was my ultimate plan, yeah. is I would probably not raise money from investors early. And the reason is, is you're going to sell you're going to sell an, an investor on a story that may have strategically a lot of opportunity, but the reality is you can more than likely bootstrap it in the beginning, create value by being paid to learn what you want to do and being paid to develop what you want to scale and then raise the money at a point where you can justify a valuation that makes it better off for you as the founder. Right. So I wouldn't necessarily look at it from the standpoint, is it in, would an investor be interested in investing as a founder? I wouldn't want to take the money in that cycle. Yeah. It would be too early um, because um, the, I oftentimes in, have in the past pushed off investors. I, I, I've gotten investors ready, but I pushed them to the point where I'm comfortable that I can justify a valuation at a better number, which means I sell a smaller portion of the company. In a perfect world, what happens is, is you want to raise money at the point where you've maximized the valuation and you've uh, you've run out of runway. In a perfect world, you have zero dollars. The value is at its maximum and the next dollar comes in the day you run out. Right. That doesn't happen. It's risky as hell. And you never want that to take place. But that's the perfect. Right. And so in your particular situation, I just wouldn't raise the money until I was in a position to say I got paid to build the product. I got paid to build the SaaS product. This is our vision. This is our valuation. This is what we're doing. All right. Now let's talk about. Times I'm a little, there it is. All right. So next thing you're going to do, they're going to do due diligence on is the financial projections, right? So first of all, do you have realistic expectations? Are you going to do 1 billion after year three? Maybe you are. Right. But you better damn sure be comfortable that you can do that. And you better be able to justify that you can do that, because the reality is the investor does not believe you. Um, um, and, and, and listen, I'm going to say something now that I, I would if I was pitching an investment, this is the term I would never use, but it gets used in, in 75 percent of pitches. They say I have a conservative estimate of whatever. Right. Come on. No one believes you make a conservative estimate, even if you have a conservative estimate. So don't even use the word, right? Um, because it's just a little tedious. For me, when I hear people say that, even investors, I think, cringe a little bit because they're like, come on, you don't really think that. And I don't believe it either. Right? So, so just kind of leave some of those words out. But make sure you have realistic assumptions, assumptions in, your, in your financial project, uh, uh, um, projections. This 1% market share, right? This is another one of these taglines that everybody says, and because of that, 
an investor kind of perceives it as naivety on the on the uh, on the on the from the from the founder. If you say that if I just get one percent market share, that I have a business. Well, I mean, it's just heard too much. Don't say it. I'd rather you say I'm going to get ten percent market share than one percent, because then at least hopefully that's based on something. Whereas market one percent is just your attempt to sound like I just need a little piece and I have a business. Um, and because it's heard so often, it's a bit of a tedious, it's a tale to naivety from the founder um, by the investor. Um, do you know your cash flow timing, right? So if you built your models and stuff. Now, when you're doing your pitch, you're more than likely not doing cash flow timing. But when you're actually providing, uh, doing deep dive due diligence, and they're talking about what is your burn rate? What am I looking at in terms of when you're going to need cash for the next time? You know, what are current market conditions? You know, if you... Some of you have tried to raise money over the last eight or nine months. Not ideal. Um, so market timing, I mean, the market conditions are a big factor in raising money as well. So understanding when you need cash is incredibly important. I had a business partner one time. He took three companies public in his career. Great guy. Um, passed away a few years ago in his mid 80s, um, but was a super guy. Um, but he used to always tell me that you need to start raising money minimum six months before you need it then you've got at least some options in the event that it's not coming very quickly, but minimum six months before you need it. Um, do you have reasonable ex expenses? If the company's burn rate is $100,000 a month and you're paying yourself $75,000 a month, investors are not going to think that's reasonable. Um, doesn't matter if, you're, if your market value is that, doesn't matter, right? So do you have reasonable expenses? Um, do you have a realistic revenue growth? Um, you know, there's a reason they call it the hockey stick, right? You start like this and then you go like this. Um, if you show that slide with a hockey stick, people are uncomfortable. Uh, first of all, revenue doesn't grow that way, right? Revenue grows like this because what happens? You get a big customer, right? And then you absorb the customer and you don't generate much revenue. And then you absorb another big customer, right? Um, so do you have a reasonable uh, revenue growth? Market salaries versus equity, right? So that's kind of my point in regards to what you pay yourselves. Um, if your if the founders are paid market value, they're way overpaid. If your employees are paid way under market value, you don't have a team that's going to stick around. Um, now they can be incentivized sometimes with equity. Sometimes that's enough to keep keep employees on board, right? But more than likely, you get what you pay for. And if you're paying, you know, Dollar Tree prices for your developers, you're probably getting Dollar Tree developers. Um, and so make sure that you understand that in regards to, to not only your business, but what your investors are going to hopefully see. Are the margins incredibly slim? I always say all the time, the last thing I want to do is be in the grocery store business, right? If my margins are 5%, there's a lot of things I can do in the world that's a lot easier than a 5% margin. Um, and so make sure that you're building a business where the margins can justify not only the risk, but justify the effort and the potential exit for your investors. Um, what does the balance sheet look like and how's the cash flow management for the company? So those are the kind of things that an, that an investor is, is more than likely going to want to know. Now, what else? These are some other general things that, uh, that investors are probably going to look at. This is kind of the catch-all bucket, right? So... What are your general impressions of the, of the founders in the startup? As an investor, those are the kind of some of the things that they're looking at. What's the culture of the organization? Is it really toxic? Does everyone hate everybody, each other? Listen, there's a fine line here. I remember one time there was a company, one of the companies I started, I had a, um, I had a, we had actually acquired a company uh, as part of the, the growth of the business. And they had a development team, really rock star development team, and they had a customer support team. Um, and, um, we would have these, these calls about future products or future features and when we were going to roll them out and all this, other, if it was ready to be rolled out and stuff like that. And they had a really sophisticated way that they rolled out these new services. And it was, um, and it was good because the reality is, is that, you know, we had at the time, we probably had 30 or 40,000 pieces of equipment deployed all over the world. And if you brick 40,000 pieces of equipment, meaning they don't work anymore, that's a disaster, right? The business company just goes out of business. And so we would be on these development calls every week and the development guys were screaming at the customer service guys and the customer service guys were screaming at the development guys because like, you know, 
what are you talking about? We're not rolling that out, blah, 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 because I have to support it and whatever. And I'll never forget, I got off the call and one of the guys that was in the room with me was like, what a disaster. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, man, I mean, they're just screaming and yelling at each other. And I'm like, yeah, that's exactly what we want. I mean, we want our customer service guys pissed because they know they have to support it. And so they're pushing back. We want our development guys to set up the best or the, the most innovative thing in the marketplace because that's their job, right? And the truth is, is the arguing between the two is going to get us the best balance, right? So I'm not saying that toxic means that the argument takes place. It's toxic means that people call each other names uh, and it's not a good environment. The reality is, is that friction or conflict isn't necessarily a negative thing in a startup. It's the way that the conflict is managed, right? So what's the culture of your organization? Um, sometimes they want to talk to the employees. Um, if you're not comfortable letting them talk to your employees, it's kind of like, mm, wonder why, what, they're, what are they hiding, right? Um, sometimes they'll ask for references. Um, do you have other references that you can give me that I can call and talk to? Are there other investors that are in the deal that I might be able to call and ask questions to? Um, they might want to talk to customers. I, I've talked to customers before and, and to, to get a, a, an idea of what customers. Now, as an investor, I know that you're probably only going to give me a list of customers that are good customers. Right? You're probably not going to give me the ones that are the bad customers. Um, but still, it's, some, it's something I might want to do as an investor. So be, be prepared if that's the case. Um, they might want to talk to your other investors. Uh, they want to see who your advisors are. Right? So if you've got really competent advisors who are willing to let you put their name on a deck that says this is an advisor, that helps. Right? Um, it doesn't help if they call up the advisor and they're like saying, well, I don't even know who that is. What are you talking about? So make sure that you have their permission to put their name on your deck. Um, sometimes they'll call and talk to competitors. I've done that before. Sometimes on a company I've started, I've called and talked to my competitors. Because sometimes, and listen, I'm not hiding anything. I'm not calling and doing secret shoppers. Sometimes I'm just calling up just, just, just to see what I can figure out. Because I've actually had customers, competitors before, that I've had customers I'm not a good fit for, and I refer to someone else because they do something better than I do or whatever. Um, so they might want to talk to your competitors. Um, I've kind of mentioned this before, but what is the valuation? Listen, here's, here's the thing that understand about valuation. And, and it's, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting dilemma when it comes to valuation in regards to founder, uh, uh, investors. Is if you're dealing with an investor that is literally trying to claw everything they can out of you, um, they're not the right investor. Because if they're, if they're having a discussion with you and say, look, I think your valuation's high. Here's why I think it's high. Here's why I need a better valuation to justify this level of risk this early. That's the kind of conversation you would expect to have. If you've got somebody trying to claw 5% more or 10% more or whatever, the reality is, is they don't understand early stage investors, uh, early stage investments or early stage founders. Because the reality is, is the last thing an investor wants to do is to uh, disincentivize the founder. Because if I've clawed 80% of the business away and now the founder's like, man, it's not worth me sleeping under the desk every night, working seven days a week. You know, I haven't seen my family in, in a month for 20% of the business. Because guess what? If you walk, you walk in and hand the keys to the investor, guess what? The company more than likely folds because the investor is either not capable of running it or whatever. So if the investor is just, you know, I mean, just pounding you on valuation without some level of conversation, more than likely that's a red flag. that They're probably not going to be a very good investor. So just keep that in mind as well. But my counter argument is if an investor does say, hey, I think your valuation is a little high, it's worth a discussion, then it's probably the right way to manage that. The other thing is, is that an investor tells you that you said, well, I think I'm good. I'm not interested, but every investor tells you that and you need to look in the mirror. It's more than likely you have a problem with evaluation. And then finally, how long, right? So how long does the due diligence process take? Sometimes it takes several months. Sometimes it takes several weeks. Um, the one thing I will say is um, understand that it takes as long as it takes. Sometimes there are, you might want to not want to deal with it anymore and just say, look, it doesn't look like this deal is going to close. 
and that'll be fine. But one thing I will say is that so, there are only a few situations in my entire career where a founder has said, look, this is going to close in two weeks. And it actually closed in two weeks. More than likely, it's still open in two months, right? So um, investors often, active investors who do a lot of deals, more than likely aren't going to be swayed by, it's probably going to close in two weeks. Um, because lots of times it doesn't close. So they don't necessarily think that way. Now, so an investor has gone through this whole process. They've sat down with you, whatever the due diligence process is, they've either handed you a sheet to ask you to fill out everything and then they've scheduled meetings or they've come to your office or they've met with your investors and they've done all these things. Then they still have to answer the question for themselves. Do they still believe that this is a real opportunity? No deal is perfect ever. There's always a problem with every deal. The question is whether or not you still, with those problems, believe that it's it's real and has a great deal of potential to succeed. And the answer is no, then the investor should walk away. Um, do you feel that you can provide value? Meaning as an investor, do you feel like that you know something about the space? And in the event that the company gets into trouble, can you step in and help in some way, provide them connections, mentorship, or something else that helps provide value that increases the likelihood that the deal is going to be successful? There are lots of investors who write a check and they never you, they get your hopefully quarterly update. Um, and as a result of that, then then they just they don't worry about it. But lots of other investors like to be just a little more active and like to help if necessary. Know yourself and know your group. What I mean by that from the investor perspective is that if if you know your angel group and you know the likelihood of them investing in a uh, a computer uh, a consumer packaged good product is relatively low. Don't put that deal in front of them um, because more than likely you're wasting everyone's time. And then ultimately have a process to decide. Ultimately, what I what I mean there is that if you're dealing with an angel group, understand what their process is. Sometimes an angel group is very independent, right? So you pitch to a group and every individual angel makes their own decision, which means that they just show up for the meetings, they listen to the pitch, and then they schedule their own due diligence or discussions with it. Some groups operate as an entire group, right? So they might group the majority wins. The majority means there's an investment. It all comes out of a set fund. And then they can sidecar additional money on top of that. So your understanding of the way that they do the deal will help you understand how to navigate that in terms of actually getting a deal closed. Um, so, so that's important to know as well. All right. So that's my talk on due diligence. Um, there's a lot of stuff to cover. The one thing I want you to take away from this is that um, as a founder, sometimes due diligence seems a little personal, right? Now, because guess what? There, there's Here's the way that you should look at it. They've at least seen enough positive that they're willing to do due diligence because if they weren't interested at all, they wouldn't start due diligence, right? But guess what? Due diligence is going to be focused on all the things that they don't like. Um, and the reason is, is because they're going to have to be working on trying to get comfortable with the deal, even though they know there are lots of problems with the deal. Right. And so that's the way you should look at it is that instead of it, you know, they're wanting to know uh, what size pants I wear. Instead of worrying about that, you should be basically saying, OK, if if I can answer the questions as effective, effectively as possible, then I can put them at ease and that increases the likelihood that they're willing to do the deal. And then secondly, as I mentioned, um, if they're doing due diligence, there's some level of interest because if they had no interest, they wouldn't do any due diligence. Um, so, so understand that as well. Now, any questions at all, and you can ask me anything. Um, David says, available to throw rocks at my pitch. If so, can we get, uh, yeah, sure. Listen, David, you can schedule a time with me and we can do a pitch on, on Zoom or whatever as well. So there's lots of different options there. Um, and I can do that. Yeah, Alex. Um, how long do some of these due diligence processes go for? And uh, how do you know if the deal is going towards uh, success or? Yeah. It's a good question. I, as I mentioned earlier. You have to repeat that question. Yeah, thanks, Maggie. I, I always need the reminder because I can never remember that. Um, Alex's question was, how long How long should due diligence take or how long does it take? And then secondly, what was the second part? Oh, how, how to get a better understanding on whether or not the deal will close or not close based on the due diligence cycle. Yeah. 
but that has gone through too many of these, so um, I don't have a don't have a feel pattern yeah. for getting an understanding yeah. of so listen, here's what I'll say. Um, in the vast majority of cases, if someone has no interest, then you just get a no. If it drags on, there's some reason it's dragging. There may be something in the process. There may be a, a partner is out of town. Um, there may be, uh, we, well, obviously we just came out of a holiday cycle. So sometimes those things affect those kind of things because for the most part, investors want to mark it off the list if they're not going to do the deal. Um, now, it doesn't mean that it can't, it might end up taking a long time. There may be discussion or arguments among the partnership on whether or not, and maybe they table it to the next meeting before they have another discussion about it, right? Doesn't mean that it increases the likelihood it will close or won't close because it depends on the situation. I've seen deals, and funny, it's funny because I was talking to a guy the other day and, uh, and he was talking about a, an investor they worked with one time. And he said, we started the pitch. It was, a vi it was a virtual pitch. We were 10 minutes in. And the guy said, yeah, I've heard enough. And I was like, we screwed up. And he said, the first thing I thought was, I guess we messed up. And his next comment was, send the term sheet, get the wiring information set on the money, right? So my point is, is sometimes they close really fast, right? Sometimes they take longer to close. As long as there's not a no, there's still at least some chance, right? But I will also say that some investors, I have seen some investors before. I remember one time I was talking to an investor. I was like, well, what did you, what did you tell him? I said, well, I told him, I said, what do you think? Are you going to do the deal? And he said, well, I don't, I don't, I don't think I'm, I'm probably going to do it. And I was like, well, what did you tell him? I said, well, I told him maybe. And I said, well, you understand for a founder, that's a 95% yes, right? Because that's the world they live in. They have to live in that level of world of confidence. Because if they get a maybe, that's like almost yes, right? That's not in the middle, halfway between yes and no. That's at least almost a yes, right? So I think sometimes some investors probably don't, um, don't provide that quick no. Um, but the vast majority, if they're not interested, they're just not going to do due diligence or they're not even going to start. So if it's still open, I think there's always a chance. So good question. What else? Anybody? Um, yep. Um, I I heard you talking earlier about um, uh, geo restrictions being lifted due to the pandemic. Some of that, I have seen some of that change for sure, yeah. You mean in terms of physical products? Yeah, okay. And then I was going to say later on that, you know, cheap equals cheap if you have a dollar store team, you look at a dollar store mm -hmm. expectation. Mm -hmm. What are your um, thoughts on? Manufactured in another country mm -hmm. versus America, where resources are yeah. a lot more expensive. Does the does do I as a founder have any say in where my product is manufactured without harnessing? Yeah, good question. So, Maggie, the, the the question was especially in regards to manufacturing. Are there? I mentioned before that maybe there's some hesitation about international versus domestic or things like that. But specifically the question is around manufacturing. The truth is, is that the vast majority of products that are made in this world are not made in the United States. So the vast majority of investors understand that, guess what? If you want certain types of product made, those products are not gonna be made in the US. So that doesn't mean they're gonna be turned off by that because the truth is it's not gonna be manufactured in the US. What I'm referring more to is, and I'm not even necessarily referring to development, meaning that if you've got developers or coders in, in another part of the world, that's not necessarily seen as a negative thing. But if they're employees, that's a completely different situation than if you've outsourced a development team, that they're consultants, and guess what? They have 50 projects on the books. That feels a little different, right? It feels like you don't have a lot of control. It feels like that... Um, that there's no loyalty there because guess what? They're trying to finish your project to move on to the next project. It also feels like that in an attempt to try to go an inexpensive route, maybe the company is at risk because if the technology isn't developed correctly, then, then you've got nothing, right? So I would say that manufacturing is, ver is, is, is viewed differently than other things um, because the truth is we don't make a lot of stuff in the US. Uh, it has to be made somewhere else. Um, yeah, so it, that's just the truth, and and the and 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 
globalization, the global economy is changing as a result of the concentration of manufacturing in one part of the world. And as a result of that, that's going to change. Um, but but what, what I'll also say is that when I was talking about Dollar Tree employees, what I really mean to say is that if you're paying someone $40,000 a year as a developer in the U.S., you could probably for $40,000 a year get one of the best developers in India, right? And so that might be looked at a completely different way. So it depends on the situation for sure. But good question, for sure. Yeah. All right, what are the questions, John, Chris? Question in chat. So let's have you deal with that. Um, Mike is getting, he's in active duty right now. So he's making ready to leave. Should he wait until the final, oh, his exit is yeah. final before even getting in front of investors? Okay, so um, I often get, this. a really good question, Mike. I often get this question on uh, when should I raise money from investors? I get that question. And, and obviously, the need of money is one of those answers, right? So I, I can't continue to move the business forward without resources. Um, but the truth is, is that, um, most of the time, investors do not invest in side hustles. They just don't. And why do they not invest in side hustles? Because they want you to take, uh, they want to take your boat, they want you to take your boat to the island and the island is your startup and they want you to burn the boat because they don't want you to have, they're going to give you their money. So they don't want you to have a way off the island. Uh, they don't want you to say, you know what, this startup stuff is really hard. I know I raised half a million dollars, but I have a real job that pays me every week and I'm tired of working on this and blah, blah, blah. So the truth is, Mike, uh, you want to advance it as far as you can, but the reality is, in some cases, you might be able to raise some money from friends and family or something to get things started. But most, what I would call arm's length investors or investors that are investing from a financial perspective, they want you all in on the deal before they give you their money. Because the last thing they want you to do is to be a part-time founder uh, with a part-time mentality in trying to start the company. Doesn't mean that that's always the case. Um, maybe you wanna start having discussions with investors and say, I'm exiting the military in four months. This will be my first full-time gig when I leave. So as a result of that, I'm starting to talk to investors now to prepare for that to take place. Um, but understand that they're going to expect a significant level of commitment, for sure. What concerns me about that particular ask is he didn't talk about his product or service, whatever his company is going to be. We don't know what the status of that is. Right. And so in, until you've gotten that pretty well wired and you're able to really be close to putting a product in the market, then you probably shouldn't be talking to investors. That's what yeah. your friends and family are for. That's exactly right. And to Maggie's point, um, Investors, the further along you are, the more likely they are to invest. The vast majority of the time, really early stage investors are not going to invest in your idea. They're just not. They're going to want you to bootstrap to get it to a certain point, get your product at least close to being ready for launch before they actually put their money in the deal. Um, I'll never forget one time I had a business partner. He said, hey, I need you to go to this launch with me. And I was like, who is it? He's like, this guy wants me to invest in his, in his business. He's like, hey, will you tag along? And I was like, yeah, sure. So we went and met with this guy and this was probably 20 something years ago. Um, and he had basically developed, you know, we obviously used to all hand out business cards. We don't hand out as many business cards we used to, but we used to always hand out business cards. But his business card was a CD-ROM. It was the same size as a business card. It was shaped kind of like a rectangle with a rounded end. And you would hand someone that and it had your business card on it, but you dropped it in your in your disk drive on your computer, which nobody even has one anymore. But you dropped it in your disk drive and you put it in and it's played a video and talked about your product. Right. And so we went and met with this guy and he said, he said, uh, how much are you raising? He said, I'm raising twenty five thousand dollars. And the guy was like, my business partner was like twenty five thousand dollars. He's like, it sounds like to me you need three or four credit cards. I don't understand. What, what, why would you need twenty five thousand dollars? Why would you take my money even? Why don't you just do it yourself? And he said, well, you know, that's incredibly risky. And my business partner was like, let me get this straight. You're not willing to take out, you're not willing to take out personal debt to start the business, but you want me to take my money and put in the business, right? So to Maggie's point, you know, 
most of the time, investors don't like to invest that early. They want to see some traction before they get there. And then uh, Ying, Mei, Ying Mei, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name, for SaaS products, what's MRR you, you see that will be enough for you to pull the trigger on investment? Okay, so monthly recurring revenue. So um, I, I, there's no way to say what number that is, right? It depends on the industry. Um, it depends on lots of factors. It, it depends on what your burn rate is. So it's hard to say if you have a $50,000 monthly recurring revenue, then I'm in because I don't know, are you burning half a million a month? I don't know. Is the market size so small that you've got 60% of the market already? There's lots of factors that go into that. So I can't answer that directly. The more you have relative to things like burn rate or size of the market, the more likely someone is to invest. But I will also say the fact that you do have monthly revenue makes me more comfortable than if you had no monthly revenue. So it, it is nuanced in terms of the answer. It's hard to say a specific number. Um, the more, the better. That's what I would say. All right, good question. You know? Yeah, actually, you got no questions. It's uh, a bit tangential, but it falls along with your valuation piece of it too. As a founder, what level of equity are you willing to cut over for a pre seed round? Is that like 10, 15%? What do you think? You know, it's a good question. Um, listen, I, there's so many factors that go into that. It would be hard to say. Um, you know, it 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 you know it depends on um, how big the market is. It depends on your valuation. It depends on what kind of traction you have. Um, um, I, I, it's hard to say. Uh, it's hard to say. I, I think that the truth is is that you know if you're in a pre-seed round, give me selling 25, 30 percent of your business, you're dead. You know, if you're, you know, sub 20 for sure, you need to be there probably. But, um, you know, I would say if I just, you, you forced me to give you a number, I'd say, you know, somewhere between um, um, in a pre-seed round, you're probably going to be giving away somewhere between 10 and 15, maybe 20. But, but if you're, if you're doing, if you're doing much more than that as a founder, you're not going to be happy after this next round or the one after that, more than likely in your seed round, you're going to lose control of the business. Um, so it can't be too high for sure. Other questions. Do you have another question? Um, okay. yes. Chris. I first pitched this one time and sell this back here money and build this work. But they couldn't build it because they couldn't figure out how. Okay. You mean the tech, the technology people? Yes. Okay. Software, everything. It's like I'm having a hard time just finding a team. Okay. So if I how am I going to ask them to build a product? They don't even understand what I'm doing. Yeah. So it's a good question. So Chris asked the question. She she's struggling to find a, a technology team who's capable of building a product for what she wants to do. Um. Uh, Chris, in those situations, to be fair, most often um, you're better off finding a partner um, who is a technology person because then they can help lay it out um, and do that. Because the truth is, is that, um, you know, uh, development consultants are incentivized to say yes. They just are because they're going to hopefully figure out a way to extract as much value as possible out of you, the customer, and get you as close as they can. But if they're like, yeah, we don't really know how to do it, what they're telling you is one of a couple of things. One is they really don't know how to do it, or they might be telling you, we don't want to do it, right? Uh, we think it's going to be too complicated. We don't think you can afford it, whatever that is. That may be what they're saying. So sometimes it means that they can't do it, but sometimes it means something else. Um, we have called them, right? We have worked yeah, but if, as long as they didn't take all your money, that's great. Yeah. 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 All right. So, but what I would do in your particular case is keep looking. But then, if that doesn't work, then I would find a technology partner, meaning that someone who could be your co-founder that understands the tech and they can drive the tech, um, because sometimes that that helps. Now, all right. So I've got a couple questions here. One is from Matt. Um, all right, actually, that was one I, oh, here it is. 
Yeah, if an entrepreneur is bootstrapping, developed a physical product, has IP protection, he's got a utility patent pending, building and selling MVPs and about to blow up the industry at a major music products trade show, a pitch deck, executive summary, and business plan are available. Would this startup be considered ready to pitch to investors who are familiar with the space, which is music, music products? Uh, they're expecting an urgent need for funding after the trade show in two weeks because uh, they're expecting to get orders is what I imagine. Yeah. So yeah. What, do you, what do you think about that? Listen, all right. So first of all, let's assume you're right, which is a big assumption, Matt. Um, I will tell you that as a person who has started multiple companies, um, the need for what you do is oftentimes not as significant as we believe it to be ourselves. And it usually takes us longer to get customers than we think it should. Now, but let's say that you are right and that you at a trade show go out and, and slay it and everyone wants your product or service. Um, um, then you don't have a problem, meaning that you can get investors. If you have people that sign contracts and they're willing to buy your product and you need to build it, you can get access to capital to build the product. People who have problems are people who don't have customers. Um, because the reality is, is that if you have a long line of people who are willing to buy your product or service and they're willing to send you a PO or send you a contract and say, we're ready, then you can find investors willing to fund that product or service. Now, that being said, um, I would go to the music, I would go to the convention and I would pitch it like I'm going to get every customer. Um, but I wouldn't be shocked if it didn't happen exactly the way I thought. It would. Um, but of course, you can talk to investors because the worst thing they can say is no. And guess what? For every pitch that you do, you're better at pitching. Um, so there's nothing wrong with pitching. I don't think there's ever a quote unquote too early because if it is too early, they're going to tell you too early. But there's nothing wrong with practicing the pitch anyway. Um, so that's the way I would look at it, Matt. What do you think, Maggie? Well, I know what uh, Matt's business is, and I think it's great that you're going to this trade show, Matt. If you do come back with a lot of orders, you don't necessarily need to have to go to investors. If you've got orders in hand and you just need money for the they give you cash, yeah, 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 you can probably go to a bank and uh, there are other factoring things that you can do so that you can get your product out in the marketplace. Yeah. Maggie has a good point, especially if you have, if you have orders, I remember a deal we were working on one time um, and um, it was an equipment sale and, and we didn't have the money to fulfill it. I mean, we were like, man, if they place this order, it's like $10 million. Like we don't, we, don't, we can never, we don't have the cash to do this. Um, but we put in, uh, we went to GE Capital at the time and put in a deal. So if we did get the order, they would provide us a 90 day note at some stupid number. Like it was like they were going to charge us 10% interest or 15% interest for 90 days. Well, we didn't care because we were going to make so much money on the deal. So to Maggie's point, if you do have that many orders, there's lots of ways to finance that, uh, that have absolutely nothing. And guess what? I wouldn't raise money from investors because then you're selling part of your company when the reality is you could finance it with debt. And, and still deliver uh, and keep more of your company. Yeah, so good. Um, this see, Casper had, when looking for investors, what kind of equity do you like, safes or preferred equity? Okay, so it depends on how early the deal, the investors are coming in. If this is pre-seed, um, it was interesting because I can remember four or five years ago, no one wanted to fund a safe. And everyone wanted to fund a convertible note. But then everybody realized convertible notes are kind of messy because you're like, well, I have interest on this convertible note, but it's not every interest I actually collect. Do I have to, is that an IRS issue? What do I have to do? And so here recently, people have become a lot more comfortable with safes because they're a little easier to manage from a contractual standpoint. All right, so, Billy, before you go on, define yep, a safe. <laughs> yep. what, 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 Maggie? Define a safe. Okay, For good, everybody. thanks. So, so a safe is basically a contract that determines the term with which the investment is coming in, as well as other things like the discount based on future investment or whatever those things may be. In the past, a convertible note was literally a, a debt instrument that was basically structured as a loan 
that was in essence, if the business company went out of business, it was a forgivable loan, meaning you couldn't sue the founders for the note unless they created they 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 were fraudulent in some way. Um, but it also had an interest carry that also had things like, you know, I'm charging 6% interest for the first two years, and then I can call the node at a certain time. Um, and that was the most common instrument that was used for investment. Safes are much more common now. They were made, if you ever want a copy of a safe, just type in Y Combinator safe. I think Y Combinator safe note is now used by 95% of early stage companies because it's so common and investors are used to seeing it. Ultimately, and then the question was preferred equity. For a really early stage company, it's equity is most often not only not expected by the by the investor, it's not practical because the cost associated with preparing your company and the legal documents to share to sell equity in a company that you small is cost prohibitive relative to the risk still left in the company. Right. So um, maybe in a seed round, sometimes um, you will see much more common, you know, shares, but most oftentimes it might even be an A round before you see that. It might still be some sort of safe in a seed round. Um, so that's that that's the way I would answer that question. All right, next. Why Combinator Safe Template Maggie talked about? See, yep, it's a simple agreement for future equity. Yeah. So thanks. That's actually what safe means. I can remember, Maggie, I don't know if you remember, I don't know if you know this, but um Bill Payne and I had a discussion five or six years ago, and Bill was pissed off about safes. He couldn't believe that people were actually making investments with safes. And Bill's one of you guys don't know Bill, but Bill he recently passed away. He's he's one of the the most respected angel investors, I would say, in the country, if not the world. Bill used to travel all over the world, teach people how to build angel communities or angel groups inside their communities. But Bill was, we were looking at a deal one time and Bill was mad because it was a safe, not a convertible note. And then, you know, after a few years, everyone used it, but, but no yeah, one. And from, from a fund management perspective, a safe is much easier than a convertible note. Yeah. So that interest rate gets added in at the end. So all the interest that has accrued adds into your ownership when it does convert. Um, but the convertible note causes reporting to have to happen every year about yeah. the interest that was accrued but not paid yeah. in. So it's for it a fund it really complicated for the investor. Yeah, it makes right. it really. And the other, the other problem with a convertible note versus a safe sometimes is that there's a call date. Uh, there's a date a convertible note often expires. So there's been instances in companies that we've been involved in uh, that – if one of the early investors called the note, they might collapse the company. Uh, and then you had an issue where, uh, you know, we've had a call on a note. We've got to come up with the cash today. If we don't come up with the cash today, then they basically can throw us into bankruptcy. So convertible notes had, had some more teeth in it in some way from the investor, but it also sometimes put the, the company at risk and the other early stage investors at risk as well. So it was, it, it could, and it was kind of tricky on occasion. All right, Alex. Yeah, you're going to have to. But the order downside for this one is somewhere Yeah. Yeah. Alex was just asked what's the downside, for example, on a convertible note. Uh, and we've kind of gone over some of those things. So, all right. What else? Other questions? No, well, I have a thought. Uh, yep. So, on our website, Startup NV, we do have a valuation calculator. Mm -hmm. And so, we've developed this so that the founders can put different triggers in there valuation and you know, like what the revenue is and what the the exit has to be. So it's it can be very eye-opening for the founders to go through this exercise because then you're beginning to understand the angel investor's perspective on what how your valuation changes, what that exit figure has to be. And sometimes it's just not possible. Right. Sometimes it makes you realize that the market that you're attacking is never going to support that sort of exit. So you may not be a candidate for venture investment. Yeah, and Maggie brings up a great point because you have to keep in mind that from the investor standpoint, they have to have a certain level of return to justify the level of risk they're taking at the stage of the investment. And so the calculator that Maggie's referencing allows you to go in and say, okay, if we have a valuation of X, we're selling this much in this round, what are our expectations in the next round? 
And, and one of the things you can do is you can look at your total available market and you might say, oh, in order to get a decent exit, I have to have uh, three times the total available market. And guess what? There's zero chance I'm going to get anywhere close to the three times the total available market, right? So it, it does provide you a little more insight as to why an investor may push back on the deal. And that's a pretty analytical way. Now, I will tell you, a lot of investors aren't that, I don't want to say they're not that sophisticated. I will say that they maybe go with a lot more um, intuition as opposed to being that analytical. But but the reality is, is it does help you understand the analytics part of it for sure. And that sort of dovetails, I know we're going long, it dovetails mm -hmm. on what Leith was saying in that if you've got 10 investments, five of them are going to fail. And so that's why the one that's going to be successful uh, has to return 20 or 30 X. And that's to make up for the losses of all of the other companies in the portfolio. So, you know, and I did have, I mentioned this one time before that I, so I teach classes obviously at UNLV and I remember drawing that up on the board, those companies say 10 companies and I put a hundred thousand dollars in these company, half the companies are going out of business. Guess what? Half a million dollars is gone. Uh, the other two companies become the walking dead. I can't even write those off unless I've got a zombie clause in there that allows me to write it off. Right. So now I've got 200,000. So 700,000 gone out of the million dollars I invested. Now this isn't made up numbers. These are numbers based on statistics by the angel capital association. Right. So the three companies that are left, hopefully two are going to get me a two or three times exit, which guess what pays for all my losses. And I've got one that's a 20 plus. Right. So I invested a million dollars. I made just over two. Right. Now that's incredibly risky. Now I remember I had a student one time ask me the question. It's like, well, why didn't they pick 10 good companies? And I said, they didn't think that any, they thought all of them were good companies. They didn't say, okay, these are my five bad companies. I need to put them in this bucket. They thought all of them were 20 plus X, right? Uh, and so that's the way they look at it. So that's why you have to understand um, why investors might push back on valuation, especially in an early stage business, for sure. Good. Okay, so let me just ask you one more question then, Lee. So uh, we, we've got a company and last year their revenue was 200,000. They have a large TAM, total addressable market, but they want a valuation of seven and a half million on 200,000 in sales. Oh, it probably depends on, uh, okay, so here's the way I would say. Um, I think a seven million would be tough unless their trajectory is incredibly high and unless their um, cost of customer acquisition, they have it really dialed in and they're converting at a high rate, right? If you're converting at an incredibly high rate, you're spending 20 bucks and for every 20 bucks you're getting a customer and you know exactly what your conversion rate is. Okay. Maybe. Right. But if you're like, yeah, last year we sold $200,000 worth of widgets and we think we're a $7 million valuation. And for every widget I sell, I have to go find a new customer. Zero chance. Right. You're going to get. And, me and what if they know that the lifetime value of their customers is only one year of revenue? Oh, uh, that's a disaster. <laughs> okay. I, yeah. I think it's, and I do, I think that um, to Maggie's point, um, be realistic um, in your expectations. Listen, there's a lot of deals that don't get done because the, you know, a founder comes in and says, look, we're a $20 million valuation. We have zero revenue. I'm like, okay, great. Slay the dragon, but you, you're probably not going to do it with my money. You better find <laughs> some of your own. Right? Um, but, but, you know, at a two, a twenty thousand. If you're doing two hundred thousand dollars in the previous year, and you've got everything dialed in, and you can show me the numbers, and if that two hundred thousand came in the last two months of the previous year, okay, maybe we can have a conversation. But if some of those things aren't true, it's gonna be tough. Yeah. Thank you so much, Lee, for spending all Perfect. this time with us. Thank you for the folks who came in person, and thank you to the folks online. Our next session next week is our last pitch practice and deconstruction. And then next Thursday, it's office hours. It's just help if you're having any trouble filling out your application in DLM. And I should put the link to that. And Maggie, my, um, my deck is, uh, Inez has my deck because it's in her Google Drive. Um, it's the same one I used last year. So if you wanted to send it out to anyone that wants it, they can have it for sure. We will do so. Is there, um, you know what else? We'll include the safe template from Y Combinator in case right. you guys want to look at it. That'll be in the follow-up email that comes on Friday. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. See Bye, you next Maggie. week.